Introducing the new DigiCert as the leading provider of high assurance SSL, TLS, and PKI certificates, DigiCert is all about improving security across the web and IoT. DigiCert is committed to helping customers and partners successfully deploy identity, authentication, and encryption solutions. They'll even help you figure out which certificate you need to secure your web domains, apps, devices, and more. Check out the Cert Wizard tool under the SSL tab on digicert.com. The average time between being hacked and realizing you've been hacked is one year. Can you afford to let an intruder roam your network for that long? Can your company weather the fallout when this comes to light? Black Hills Information Security can find the bad guys in your network and train you to do it yourself. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a hunt teaming engagement can help you find a persistent threat in your network. Signal Sciences is the industry's first web protection platform that works in any cloud, any container, any platform as a service, and any modern application architecture. The Signal Sciences web protection platform can be deployed in next generation WAF, RASP, or reverse proxy modes, giving customers ultimate flexibility and coverage. Protect your web applications with Signal Sciences web protection platform. Signal Sciences, protecting applications, connecting teams. For more information, check them out at signalsciences.com forward slash PSW. Welcome back everyone to Paul's Security Weekly. Keith Hoodlett, who is still with Bug Crowd, right? If today's your last day, like technically you still work for Bug Crowd. Jason it's this Haddix, weird, like on the fence. <laughs> yeah, like Jason Haddix is here with us, who's your your manager at at Bug Crowd. Jason, can you just fire Keith like live on the air? I think that would be awesome, right? Like, I mean, just be like you're fired. That's it. Done. I mean, I, I probably have some authority to do that. I, I mean, he's been so good to me, though. Uh, no, I'm actually not his boss right now. Uh, Grant is actually your boss, so you would have to call him up. We could do that live if you let's want. Let's get yeah, let's get Grant on the phone. Let's, let's find <laughs> Keith yeah, live yeah. on the air. <laughs> you <laughs> can't quit. You're fired. We, we <laughs> love you, Keith. <laughs> All right, Keith. This is or your we technical. Could just, we could raise a glass to Keith. Yes. And, and congratulations yeah. to the, great, the grateful departed. <laughs> Gratefully departed. Congratulations. I am raising a can to Keith. Me as well. I appreciate it. Uh, all this right, so I have to share screens, don't I? Let's see here. How do I do this? Uh, <clears throat> this is my first time giving a technical segment on, on Paul Security Weekly, by the way. This ought to be interesting. I'm so excited. You oh, could, you're doing it. You could almost smell it. I should have been anticipating. Oh, God. Like, I'm seeing the... Whoa, that's all a right, lot cool. of stuff. Going on. Whoa. Hey, I know that one. So, uh, technical segment for tonight. I'm going to be actually covering a little bit about uh, the basics of bug bounty hunting. I'm not going to go too deep into it, but I wanted to, to share with the audience that is interested in getting into bug bounty hunting how to do it and, and some of the tools, techniques, and practices or procedures that you might use. Uh, the first and foremost thing that you need to do is, if you're interested Just in bug bounty your, hunting... Make your video full screen. I'm not going to play the video, so oh. it's, it's fine. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> so uh, the first thing that you need to do, though, is go watch Jason Haddock's The Bug Hunter's Methodology V3-ish. I've linked to it in the show notes. Uh, I have to say, I watched this from version one last year at Level that, Up. Was one. that version one-ish? It was actually version <laughs> 1.0, I think, in oh, fact. Okay. Um, yeah. But it, 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 needless to say, is, is thankfully he's here on the line with us still, but... Um, I have learned an incredible amount from having worked directly with Jason and then, of course, following a lot of the work that he's done in the industry. And so this video, more than anything else, is going to cover a lot of the things that I'm going to cover tonight. But I want to show you that you can have success by following these methods. Uh, in fact, as of Sweet. this morning... Sweet. That concludes this technical segment. All you have to do is go watch that video and you have all the information. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Thanks, Keith. Um, the, nice, the nice thing is, is I've taken all of the links out of the video, and I've now put them in the show notes. So you can go to wiki.securityweekly.com slash episode 564, and you're going to get all the links to the things that I'm talking about. I want to show the, the listeners that are actually watching the feed, though, that I've actually been very successful as a result of the lessons learned from that video. So as of this morning, I'm ranked 76 on Bug Crowd, which is pretty awesome, considering there's something like, what, 80,000 plus people registered as security researchers on the platform. So um, this was a, a great personal achievement of mine. From when I joined Bug Crowd, I was ranked 65,000 something. Uh, I was rank 150 until last week. And then I put in a bunch of effort and now I'm ranked 76. So uh, now that I'm no longer an employee, I'm officially ranked on the platform, which is kind of cool. I've had a blockbuster month. Um, yeah, but you're still not number one. So I'm still not impressed, Keith. Sorry. 
So needless to say, the, the number one individual on the platform who goes by the handle Mongo is a beast. Let me just show you real quick where he stands. So he he's at actually this user right here, uh, 22,790 points. Uh, I think the top 10 is somewhere around the 6,000 plus range. I'm only at about 1,200 uh, points. So all the same, I will get there, Paul. Don't you worry. Mm. That, that will happen eventually. Uh, maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. Uh, maybe if the rank one person gets hit by a bus, but all the same. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so, so in the meantime, I did want to share a few things that are important. So first, uh, I, I hunt on bug crowd, not only because I was an employee there, uh, no longer, uh, but also because I really enjoyed the process that, that bug crowd goes through in terms of triage and validation, rewarding of points on, uh, moving things to unresolved, et cetera. So I'm going to jump into those in a minute. Um, one of the most important things though, that has guided my hunting, especially on bug crowd, is the vulnerability rating taxonomy. Now, this evolves over time, and it was actually put together by Jason and a number of other people at bug crowd in terms of rating a vulnerability not only on the context and the impact, but of course, from here, the severity that it's going to impact your organization at the end of the day. So things like remote code execution are critical. You need to address them right away because, well, that box is no longer your box. Or as the famous sticker and T-shirts from Bug Crowd say, my other computer is your computer. Uh, so these are the sort of things that I focus on as priority one, priority two, and priority three vulnerabilities. There's maybe 20 to 30 of them in all. Um, I don't actually report anything below priority three just for, for personal uh, reasons. I, there are people that do plenty of that. I like to keep my rating or my um, severity below a three because to me that that matters. Uh, so it's just kind of a personal preference. But to that end, understanding these uh, rating taxonomies is going to help you as a hunter. And the reason is because if you think you have a vulnerability and you can go and look and compare it to where it's going to fit in the vulnerability rating taxonomy, you just might find that you're in luck. Really good example of this. And, and Paul, you'll probably cringe because you were probably doing this as a developer back in, you know, I don't know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Is... Hey, no, I'm not. Was I? <laughs> no, never mind. I am old. Continue. <laughs> uh, so, so specifically, broken cryptography. So I have recently got nine uh, priority one vulnerabilities out of this specific uh, broken cryptography as a cryptographic flaw, which is incorrect usage. So, Jeff, this would probably make you cringe, but what I discovered it already on one did. of the... Yeah. You know, so this is, this is an interesting one, right? Because what I discovered was a company that was base64 encoding their passwords before they passed them back to the server. Now, mm -hmm. as a developer, I know that that's wrong. And the reason I know that's wrong is because you should be passing it back as whatever format you've taken it in as, usually UTF-8, so it's not encoded in any way. It, word password will just show up as password. On the back end, you should be salting and hashing and then comparing that to that salt and hash when you receive the password. And then, of course, returning back a proper login or not. Now, I suspected that because they were base64 encoding the password when they were passing it back to the server, they were probably storing it as base64 encoded, which might as well be plain text. So I reported one to see, you know, test the waters, see if they were actually doing this. They said, yes, moving to unresolved, priority one finding confirmed. So then I reported the other eight because they had something like 840 servers that all were resolving to eight different domains. Uh, that It must have been their scheme for load balancing, I guess. Um, but it was simply just by looking at the request as it came through Burp, understanding that Base64 encoding of the password is not only useless, but probably wrong based on their implementation, turned out to be a bunch of priority ones, which was like 300 plus uh, kudos points, which I really, really enjoyed. So thank you for that. Um, but other what made me well cringe, since since you called my name, is, is that that's not broken cryptography. That's basically not even using cryptography. Mm -hmm. The the flaw, and it wasn't even in the implementation, so to speak. Nothing wrong with the cryptography. They just weren't using cryptography. Right. Encoding is not encryption. Encryption involves a key and it, or a salt or a hash function or something. Encoding is just, you know, usually done for data compression purposes or, or you know, wh whatever the reason they did it, it wasn't cryptography. Move on. 
Right, right. So that's exactly my my thought as well here, Jeff, was this isn't cryptography. Therefore, I should probably report it and see what happens to see if and maybe I was wrong, right? Maybe they're passing it back to the web server uh, to then be handled uh, appropriately by, you know, unencoding or re- removing the encoding and then doing all the salting and hashing, etc. So maybe it was, a, well, I don't know. So did you categorize it or do you submit it as a flaw and then somewhere in the bug crowd magic it gets categorized? So uh, in this case, I you can categorize it when you sub, uh, submit a report, right? So you can actually choose where you believe your finding uh, fits inside of this vulnerability rating taxonomy. Now, part of what Bug Crowd does in this case, though, is that uh, application security engineer and, and that team is is a team of people made up of folks from you know former White Hat members, former Fortify members. Uh, people that are actually contributed to the Metasploit project. I mean, it's a really talented bunch of people. And so that team uh, will actually appropriately categorize your finding if you have miscategorized it for some reason. Um, a good example of that is some of the some of actually my favorite simple submissions is uh, broken authentication. So uh, this one happens to be if they have HTTPS not available, or in this case, it just defaults to HTTP. So in that case, um, if I'm just maybe typing in HTTP to go to that site, but otherwise if I drop that, you know, kind of preamble and it defaults to HTTPS, then I'm wrong. That's actually a priority four finding, not a priority three finding. And they'll recategorize and validate what I've submitted before they push it into a triage state. So um, that's a good question. Any additional questions? Yeah, Keith, how, as a, a bug bounty hunter, how do you choose which bug bounty program to go after? What's your strategy? That's an excellent question, Paul. So actually going back to the programs for a moment, one of the things that I actually do here is I personally hunt on Kudos programs just because they tend to have the largest scope available. Now, uh, there are some exceptions so to wait, that. And take and, a step back. What's a Kudos program? Also a good question. So... Um, a kudos program in this case is a program that rewards points for findings, but does not otherwise reward uh, cash value prizes, right? So this is the situation where a company wants to know about all vulnerabilities, but they can't afford to know about all vulnerabilities by paying cash for all of them. Um, so for me as a researcher, what this has been is it's been a way for me to practice in terms of refining my skill set and building automation, as well as to learn new things, right? So Suddenly, I found a, a vulnerability that I might be able to actually turn around and leverage in a paid program as a result of being exposed to it through a kudos program. Um, so a really good example of that, in fact, the one that I'm going to highlight tonight is the Netgear kudos program. So this has been kind of my personal favorite program to work on. I think I've got something like 30 or 40 vulnerabilities reported into them. Um, but in this case, it is quite literally anything that Netgear owns that is not part of their cash program. What you'll notice, though, is that they have a cash program. Mm-hmm. So most of the time, that that's actually the case. Is If they're running a public kudos only, there's a high likelihood that they have a private cash program or a, a separate public cash program because there are certain things that are worth money to them. Um, in this case, for, for Netgear, it's anything that they own that isn't part of the cash rewards program in this case. Uh, which is, I think, like all of their devices, or at least many of their devices, I should say. Um, so that's kind of my my strategy is I've just been going after Kudos programs because. So with the Netgear really... uh, example, Keith, are you looking at firmware or are you looking at their web app on that firmware or both? Uh, in, in my case, I'm looking at web apps. So if you actually go over here to their cash rewards program, though, for those researchers that are into reverse engineering and are into looking at things like firmware, they actually do have an entire program where such things are in scope. So you have the ability to actually you know, go and reverse engineer Netgear Nighthawk routers for their firmware, find vulnerabilities, and report them accordingly. So they have a whole lot of targets in scope for that, too. Um, so I have a silly addition. question. Sure. So what we're looking, what you're showing us right now, you're you're in the researcher view. Yes. Okay. Uh, and I know you talked about you know how to go about signing up. Uh, is there a? And maybe you covered this already, and I missed it. I apologize. Is there a vetting process, approval process? Anybody can join. Does it cost money to join? So anyone can join or sign up on Bug Crowd. Now uh, I am actually eligible to be part of 
private programs. What that it means is if I have reported vulnerabilities, I think it's something like at least four vulnerabilities to a public program, uh, I am then potentially eligible to be part of a private program. But I first have to make, you know, make sure that I'm adhering to the rules, make sure that, mm -hmm. of course, the findings that I'm producing are valuable. And of, so that means, you know, priority three or at least better than priority four on average. And then, of course, mm -hmm. from there that they're valid so that I'm not I'm not producing just junk, but I'm actually producing things of merit or note to the company. So gotcha. uh, I am going to actually dive into that a little bit. But uh, additional questions. <clears throat> no, dive in, please. Okay, so let's get to the meat of this a little bit. One of the things that I like to talk about is, is first your setup. So for me personally, I'm actually using Firefox 56. I'm not using Quantum. The reason is for those that are watching the, the video feed is there's this nice little thing called tree style tabs, which allows you to open new tabs on the browser vertically on the left hand side. So I can actually see all of the different kind of applications that are being opened over time. Uh, in fact, for those watching the video feed, I'll show my add ons here. Uh, but I use a, a couple of different things that are now considered legacy add-ons that aren't currently or aren't yet available uh, in Quantum, which is the new version of Firefox. But one of those here is is this uh, this tree style tabs plus the ability for me to do open multiple URLs. I'll show that in a little bit. Um, and this allows me to actually go into any kind of website that I've I've actually enumerated and then open up a bunch of them, let them go through my burp proxy, let them get spidered a little bit, which gets me sometimes more details, identify some vulnerabilities right off the bat, like uh, unencrypted logins or HTTP-based logins, which are a priority three finding right away. Um, and then from there, I can do a lot of different things. So Wappalizer also lets Wait, me know what so the dev why, stack is. Why does that tree style tabs help you so much? So uh, in this case, I can actually see what each application is that opened. So I'll, I'll show you that in just a minute, Paul, because mm. I'll show you what it, what it means, right? Because when you have a lot of tabs open on a Chrome uh, browser or you know Firefox Quantum, mm. it's all going to open along the top, and eventually you lose the name. So right. it's, it's more easy to identify what the application is based on... I am selfishly uh, kind of looking for tips for visiting adult websites. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> You know, somehow yeah, no. I'm not surprised. Um, we can talk about that after the show, Paul. Sure. Uh, Sounds so, like a plan. So uh, one of the things, though, that I did want to cover as well is uh, is there are bug crowd related researcher resources, which I have linked again to in the show notes under the sites section in my technical segment uh, for anyone that's interested in different vulnerability classes and in information about them as well. So um, let's dive in a little bit as to what the, the bug bounty process actually looks like, right? So I'm a researcher. I'm interested in, in starting to get, uh, you know, into the bug bounty space. I would recommend going for a kudos program or a very open scope program to begin with. Reason is because companies are almost always, you know, shipping new web servers, changing up their development process, changing up their applications. And so if you have a really big target base, that means you have a lot of opportunity to find vulnerabilities and then get into the private crowd, which is usually where a lot of the money is made in the bug bounty process. So for me, the first thing that I always recommend, no matter who you are, is read the bounty brief and then read it again. And the reason that I say that is because there are things like program exclusions, which means you're not going to get a reward for it and you really shouldn't be doing it. Examples of that is social engineering, like, you know, phishing or vishing or walking into their office, right? They don't want you to do that. And it's not going to get you anything for it. So you might as well not waste your time. Of course, as well, sometimes they'll include things like sites. So like uh, in this case, the mynetgear.com site is, is completely out of scope. Interestingly, Netgear has kind of a, this legal terms and conditions. I'm not going to dive too deep into it. They're one of the few companies that, that have these kind of conditions there. But I think it's, you know, their legal team's way of, of allowing them to do bug bounty programs. And honestly, Paul, I think that one of the reasons that Netgear even started their program was as a result of some of the D-Link vulnerabilities that were hit uh, by FCC fines like mm -hmm. a year or two ago that you covered yep. on this show. Um, so, I so speculated they started, the same thing. I, I, I don't know. No one from Netgear has officially commented on that, but that's what I, 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 I suspect is the, tr is the truth. And to, for my end, I mean, I was not at Bug Crowd at the time that they started their program, so I can't really mm -hmm. comment on it other than to say they now have 900 in vulnerabilities rewarded, in this case, kudos-based. Um, so almost 1,000 vulnerabilities found on 
you know, anything that they own beyond that firmware based asset uh, reported through this program, which I thought was really awesome. So, yeah, hey, one- I got a question for you, Keith. Sure. You, you, you know, when you were showing some of the, the, the vulnerabilities that you found and you were pointing out broken authentication and using, uh, you know, HTTP to pass the credentials, that's a finding. You said that's an automatic finding. Uh, I, I joke a lot about why don't the bug bounty bug bounty programs pay out for finding a default password. I am curious, though, is is it a finding to find websites not enforcing um, a strong or complex password out of the gate? Or is that more like a recommendation? It It might be part of the vulnerability rating taxonomy. Um, Haddix, go ahead. Uh, Yeah, so both of those. So default credentials, um, we have broken down into three sections. So really the the impetus between between what's called the VRT and the difference between that and something like OWASP or CVSS is so that we can delineate a little bit and get more granular as to how risky each one of those things is. So um, so for that one specific example of default creds, right, um, we have a couple of examples of default creds. If they let you into a staging server, it's a little bit less risky. It's a P2. But if they let you into a production server with default credentials, that's absolutely a finding. Uh, it's a pretty critical one. Um, so there's that. Uh, the complexity one, I think it's very low on our priority rating. Uh, password password complexity is somewhere on the VRT, either P4 or P5. So um, those best practices, we call them, um, people care about them, right? People want to know about these things where they're not applying good security best practices. So um, they are in the VRT and they are rewardable. So that's why it really um, it really should drive people who are doing the hunting to really read because it'll open up your eyes to some of the things that customers really want um, and it'll help you find payable, rewardable bugs uh, in the list. Well, do you, do you have the ability to report on flag, filter, however you describe it, if uh, the particular website, let's say it's an e-commerce site, uh, mm-hmm. and, and there's, you know, I have to bring up PCI. Wow, I went an hour hour and a half before I mentioned <laughs> everybody but drank. If if there's a if there's a regulatory requirement that says, you know, this website should be behaving a certain way, like in terms of handling credentials, uh, do you do you report on those types of findings? You know, tied back to a compliance or a regulatory requirement? Or is that if, more up to the customer to connect the dots? Yeah, it's it's mostly up to the customer. I would say when we do a PCI pen test service, like when we sell that to somebody Um, The focus Mm -hmm. is on the PCI methodology, which has a lot of verbiage around what best practices are in relation to handling certain types of data. So, um, but as the default VRT, vulnerability rating taxonomy, I don't think that there's any that are specific into um, those PCI rules. I think that we just do like password complexity and um, rate limiting, you know, like rate limiting or lack of CAPTCHA uh, ability. Like these are all low level findings, Mm -hmm. but um, ability to trigger an email generating form with automation with uh, no rate limiting. Like these are all very low and they're all considered best practices, but they still are important to most people and they do fit into those compliance kind of niche questions. So yeah, we, we have some of them there. Um, it would be an interesting exercise. What, what we do have customers do is they customize our VRT. So we VRT is a suggestion to everybody um, and it helps the hunters know to get an expectation of what they're going to get paid and what their bugs are triaged as. Um, but when a customer signs up, they have the ability to edit the VRT classification. So if they don't care about a certain class, classification of bug, um, they remove it. Or if they care about something that's not in there, they'll add it. And then we have the ability to be transparent with the researchers. Um, so they basically uh, know what to hunt for. And, you know, uh, really transparency is the key to the, the whole thing, the whole enchilada. It's um, letting the researchers know, you know, that we're in the middle, they're fighting for them, that, you know, they have all the information, that they're not going to, um, you know, face any unnecessary hurdles. So that's kind of how we deal with some of those problems. You you said earlier what it was, but I'm old and it blew by me. VRT again stands for uh, vulnerability rating taxonomy. It's the bug crowd vulnerability okay. rating taxonomy. Yeah. Is is that published, or, or do you have to be registered as a as a user? Okay. No, it's, it's open source. Maybe. A lot of companies have started using it in, in lieu of OWASP, actually, and. Um, it's actually open source on GitHub. So if you disagree with one of our risk ratings um, or uh, you think that we don't have enough verbiage or you don't think we have a variant that's important to list, go ahead and put in a pull request on GitHub. Our VRT council meets every week. Um, there are some pretty strong dudes in AppSec and they, uh, they talk about each pull request and if we need to change it, it's a continually updated 
kind of version of the OWASP top 10, but uh, far surpassing 10 vulnerabilities. Cool, thanks. So to, to jump back into some of the tools though that I use, so after I've looked at a program and I've identified a little bit about um, you know what's in scope, right? Like that's the biggest thing to me is, is what am I actually gonna get rewarded for and what's worth my time actually reporting against? In the case of Netgear, it's everything that they own. Uh, in the case of Tesla, there's a large swath of, of their um, you know, product suite that's available, including a lot of their web apps. There's a few things that are listed as out of scope, but I look for what can I get away with reporting against? Because uh, I like to use a lot of the enumeration and recon tools that, again, Jason Haddix has given a lot of coverage and, and uh, discussion about in terms of his talks. So to that end, for, for me, one of the things that I actually picked up from uh, Jason was the idea of mind mapping. So for me, I've actually built out, I, I use uh, a couple of different tools. I've been trying to use Xmind Zen, but they just released uh, a version that now allows it to like do audio based uh, typing. And so it always leaves your microphone on and always listens to your microphone. And I'm not a big fan of that. So I've stopped using it again and I'm, I'm waiting for them to fix that. Um, so Simple Mind Pro is a, a Mac OS uh, native mind mapping tool. And as you can see, I've got a bunch of different top level domains as owned by Netgear that I can then go ahead and do things like subdomain brute forcing against uh, to figure out what are all of the domains inside of these different top level domains that I can actually then potentially attack. So of course, there's, there's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of top level domains. And then one of the things that I use uh, to actually do the domain uh, research, or in this case, uh, find all of the subdomains. I use a tool that Jason Haddix recently covered, and I actually just tested today, called AMAS. And, and AMAS is a, a subdomain enumeration tool written in Go that will go ahead and, and actually look for, uh, whether it's through Google or Bing or Baidu or a number of other public kind of repositories of data, all of the different uh, subdomains that exist for all of those different top level domains that I've just listed. And what that allows me to then do is build kind of a target list, right? The other tool that I also use for this, which I find to be a lot faster, is Subfinder. So uh, again, based on Jason Haddock's talk, Subfinder is another tool written in Go that also scrapes a number of different tools, including, uh, let's see if it goes down here on the bottom, things like virus total, passive total, census, Riddler, security trails, et cetera. You can put in API keys for additional services that existed on the internet. And then from there, go ahead and do additional scraping to see if you can find subdomains off of those top level domains that I've listed. So as you saw here, there's something like, I don't know, 15 or 20 top level domains that I've got for Netgear that they could potentially own. And then from there, if you can imagine the number of subdomains, I can then go ahead and start to brute force and look for all of those domains. So for me, uh, one of the things that I do is with AMAS, it's a pretty simple command. In fact, I'll, I'll increase this here so that you guys can see a little bit about um, what I was just doing. So bear with me for just a moment. Uh, let's see, AMAS. Here we are. I wonder if you um, like that uh, branching on the left just because you grew up on Windows. <laughs> answer is no actually for the longest time i used tabs on the top and then i i realized it was a worse a bad way to do it so um amas has a command where it allows you to go ahead and output to a text file and then use a list to go ahead and then produce uh findings so i'm actually going to do uh, a separate one because i've actually already got that list saved uh, which switch did i miss Let's see here. I missed a one, but let's let's go here to. Oh, it's you know what? I might have been using. It said it couldn't find. Now I can't see it at all. But it said parameters. It can't find netgear.txt. No such file or directory. Oh, I yeah, might have you're... already. Um, I might have already moved it. So, uh, in this case, uh, what I was doing earlier is I was actually going through it and kind of s sorting this all out. Um, but for for me. I went ahead and did an AMAS of uh, all of the different sites that I could do um, for. So I think if I went to sites here, I have a consolidated sites list, which is oh, maybe not. So um, what I did do earlier, though, is I, I took all of those top level domains. I had originally used a tool called Sublister to then go ahead and, uh, and perform 
what was the same subdomain brute forcing, but it actually would cause my digital ocean box to crash or in this case, get blacklisted by, by Google. And so it wouldn't work. Um, so I was trying to avoid the problem that Jason had, which was, I didn't want to get blacklisted by Akamai. Therefore I would do it from a digital ocean box. Um, in any case, so I've already actually run a mass. Uh, so let's see here. So you, you have a DF as a flag that you tried to use before. Remove the F and you'll be able to run it live. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, one of the things is here. Let me actually run it first so that people can see it. Uh, we'll just do can a make mass. your text bigger? Yep. So just remove oh, the DF and do netair.com. Let me remove this from full screen. And let me make my text bigger. So let's uh, let's do this. I want your so, a mass uh, to be bigger. You want it to be massive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so if you run it against uh, you know a, a top level domain, now I built an actual like netgear.txt that had all of those top level domains that you saw on the mind map, and in part of it. And so this one takes a little bit longer, but as you'll see, it starts to parse through all of the potential top level domains. Yeah, um, Carlos, so kind of Carlos Perez wrote a tool back in the day called uh, DNS Recon and did yeah. similar things like this. This seems like a, an updated version of that. Pretty so much. what these yep. tools are doing nowadays is is two classes of subdomain, what we call enumeration. One is brute forcing, which Carlos did. He was one of the pioneers in creating tools um, for this. And the other one is scraping. And mm -hmm. so what this tool is going out and doing is it's, it's going out to sites like search engines like Google, Bing, and Baidu. It's also going out to threat intel feeds, it's going out to virus total, it's going out to GitHub, it's going out to uh, about 30 different websites that provide APIs. And anytime it sees a subdomain from netgear.com, it's scraping it off that site and adding it to this list. So both scraping and brute forcing are the technologies that you look for now when enumerating subdomains. Um, and so this tool does it all, and it does it all excessively fast um, because it's written in Go and it's multi-threaded. Um, and so it's uh, it's probably one of the best innovations both uh both this one amas and Durser, or uh um sub -finder. sub finder are probably the two biggest innovations in subdomain enumeration in the last like five years that's awesome so i also have sub finder here as well now unfortunately i don't have um netgear.txt saved i think i might have deleted it earlier but if i did netgear.com here as well um now as you'll find with this one as i run it um, again, you see kind of all the, the preamble text. I'm not using any of the virus total or other API keys that it allows for. But as you also notice, I started this, you know, I don't know, two minutes after the AMAS scan took place, right? So um, what this is going to do is it's going to go ahead and do the same exact thing running against all those sources as you see above. Uh, what it, it, it is, though, as you'll find, and I don't know if we're going to have enough time in the segment to actually show it, but it's a lot faster than AMAS. In fact, I ran this against a, a private program that is open scope earlier today, uh, and there we go. It's already done, right? So if I were to do AMAS, or rather SubFinder 2, I have 1,369 domains identified wow. in you know 30 seconds, right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're alive, right? It just means that those were domains at mm -hmm. one point that have been picked up by a service somewhere. And of course, that, that AMAS is still running. Now, I did uh, go ahead and save it earlier. So I have an amas.netgear.txt that was everything that was off of that AMAS finding, which is, again, 1389. So they're almost the same, right? So, um, something and tell me, me so, somebody, something tells me, again, Paul's looking at this for surfing porn, just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Quite possibly. Probably true. Could be true. Probably true. <laughs> Uh, all the different, you know, kinds of porn that he could find off of Pornhub. Um, so all the subdomains off of it. But in any case, what I generally will do. So, Does Pornhub have a bug bounty with you? Uh, they do not have one with Bug Crowd. They do have one with a, another provider of gotcha. bug bounty services. So um, they do have a bug bounty program. Now, uh, so you could legitimize this a little bit, Paul. Yeah, uh, that's what I'm saying. As, as that's what were. I was talking about adult sites for. It's for bug bounties, not for consuming the content <laughs> what do you come on, <laughs> it's for reading so, the articles i mean the vulnerability research purposes only indeed yeah. indeed so what i normally would do is i would go ahead and, and cat out like the amas uh, dot net gear dot text um i would generally like perhaps cat that out to a file uh I perm and then i would also do the same thing with the sub finder i would then sort and unique it so that way i get a unique list 
And then from there, I actually built this sites.txt list. So as you'll see, the overlap uh, was about, I don't know, 600 or so. And then there was this middle ground. So at about 1,300, call it almost 1,400 for each individual tool. Uh, when I was done, I had about 1,900, almost 2,000 top-level domains. Now, as anyone that's sitting here and listening that's familiar with using Burp, going ahead and actually using this list to then browse 1,900 sites will probably run you out of memory on your Burp uh, pretty quickly. And, and if not, it, it's going to at least lag your system quite a bit. So I actually use another tool to, to help in the process of enumeration. So um, what this tool is, is called HTTP Screenshot. Now, let me see here. I think I have I was just going to say, other. I would totally port scan and then screenshot with whatever yeah. tool has been updated most recently for, for doing that. So mass scan is what I use for, for port scanning. I generally use it against any sort of, um, mm -hmm. well, actually, that, that's a good segue, right? So let me actually talk a little bit about Tesla, which is another fairly open scope program. So um, bgp.he.net uh, allows you to look up all of the registered IP space for a different company. Now, Netgear, in this case, is a new enough company that actually doesn't have any space registered, but companies like Tesla do. So I use things like MassScan to actually do a, a full port scan of like a .o slash 24 off of, you know, whatever IP address that is owned by the company. Netgear is, is harder because I have to do that for all of the sites specifically and not necessarily off of, um, off of network ranges. I was actually recently doing this for, uh, again, a private uh, bounty program that had something like three slash 16s, a couple of slash 20s, and a slash 24, um, which nets a lot of IP space, to say the least. Um, but again, MassScan is the tool that I use there because it is fast. I should probably add here that I've included in the show notes under my public uh, GitHub repository, so github.com slash and my hacks, H-A-C-K-S, uh, there's a scripts repository that actually has some automation to the process of running things like mass scan. I'm eventually going to do it for AMAS and uh, in SubFinder as well, but um, it allows me to take top-level domains or even uh, you know well-formed domains and run mass scan against large lists. So I could go to uh, you know that list of sites and run all of these through mass scan uh, for each one and get the ports off of them accordingly. So. Once I have a full list of, of actual subdomains, the next thing that I do is I actually use uh, that HTTP screenshot to go out and request uh, each site to see if I can get a snapshot of it, consolidate that, that snapshot down to common uh, you know, uh, headers or common uh, feedback of information that it provides, and then I can start to figure out what I want to test against. Because when you have that many domains, and you're a bounty hunter, you want to find something, but you don't have time to test everything, or if you do, you're going to test maybe one of each representative type. Uh, so to that end, for HTTP screenshot, a few things. Uh, first, I did build a Docker container. It is publicly available out on hub.docker.com. Again, and my hacks slash HTTP screenshot. It's got the commands in there for you so that you can run this uh, either locally or or even out on a DigitalOcean uh, box, but it also has links to the GitHub repo, which is also in uh, the show notes. So for me, uh, what that literally means is I would then take the sites.txt, I would just cat that out, uh, pipe it through, in this case, awk, and then just do a quick awk uh, where I'd say print HTTPS, and then do dollar sign zero, which is the, the domain, and then go ahead and put that out to say like HTTPS.txt. And so, oh, so it's actually trying to cat the, the directory here. So let me do that again. So once I've got that here, I can just go ahead and, and just you know show you that text. That, so I've prepended HTTPS to all of these. And the reason that I do that is HTTP, or rather uh, HTTP screenshot relies on you prepending each domain with either HTTP or HTTPS. Uh, generally, I start with HTTPS because you can do a couple of nice things with HTTP screenshot where it will take the cert that is used for that site and then add that to the enumerated sites that are going to be looked at. So if I actually go to uh, sites, the directory that I built, 
can go to HTTPS. As you'll see, I've already got a bunch of these things already built out. Um, but if I were to go ahead and run that Docker command that I've got in here to just run the, the actual container. So now I'm, I'm in the container and I will just do HTTP screenshot dash L the text file dash P dash W. W is workers. So if I have a, a bigger uh, digital ocean box, for example, I might use 10 or 20. And this one I have the smaller cheap uh, container or uh, droplet, droplet. So it's yeah, four. Uh, and then I can just do, uh, in this case, two additional commands. So that's going to be dash A and dash VH. So uh, dash VH is visibility, but then it also does host enumeration. So when I run this, it will now go ahead and start looking over that list and start taking screenshots of all of them. And as you see, it says like I've got 1899 remaining. Um, but what will happen is as it discovers new domains associated with any given site, and, and also, as you see here, like it, it found one that it couldn't get HTTPS, but it got the HTTP, so it'll include that. Um, so it's grabbing both the HTML and a snapshot of each site. Now, of course, that's only so useful because at, at that point, what ends up happening is you now have all of the screenshots, but you now have to go back and look through all of the screenshots, which is a pain. I mean... Looking well, through it's better than opening up 8 million browser tabs and visiting each site manually. But that's right, when you exactly. cut to commercial and you come back and you've done all the work <laughs> and found the problem. Right. So, so the other I got to tell you, is, Keith, I, I've been looking. I'm sorry. I've been looking at all this. I'm like, but when are you going to get to the hacking? So keep going. So, so I, I will actually now skip a little bit to the, the process of, of looking at this stuff, right? So now I'm enumerating all of these domains. I'm just going to like let that run in the background. And I've actually enumerated those domains. So one of the nice things you can do with HTTP screenshot is you can actually do clustering. And what that clustering is, is it allows you to basically get this nice little page. Uh, so you just open clusters.html. And then you can actually see which each one resolves to, right? So like not all of them will actually show you what it resolves to. But you identify or you start to identify, you know, pages that maybe like 403 errors or you'll get to, you know, service unavailable. Um, the interesting things, though, is when you get to pages like logins, right? So there's like ReadyNAS license has a login screen associated with it. Um, and you can do this for a lot of different things like basic auth, right? So if it's got basic auth, it means generally it'll it'll pop up with a window asking you to authenticate. Guess what? If that's HTTP, it's a priority three because it's defaulted to an unencrypted protocol, therefore you can report it, right? I've got something like 30 or 40 of those reported against Netgear just, just right off the bat. So at the end of the day, though, what you end up finding is you end up finding interesting things, and you don't always know if it's actually associated with the company or not until you've done a little bit more enumeration, right? So you have to actually figure out that the IP address that you found is in fact associated with the company that you're looking at. But in this case, I found a Jenkins server. And it, it doesn't really have much associated with it. So I, I feel okay with showing this to people because you can actually also see all of the people listed on the Jenkins server that have registered. Now, if you can confirm that this is actually owned by Netgear, and of course, from there, you can show that it presents some sort of vulnerability to their organization, you should report it. Now, from what everything I can tell, this isn't actually associated with Netgear, so I haven't actually gone and, and hacked on this. So for any of you watching the video, you probably shouldn't waste your time because it's not Netgear and you could get in trouble by actually going after the site. But what you'll find is you'll actually start to find really interesting services or websites or applications that the company doesn't even really know that they have. So this is getting back to that earlier discussion, right? Where we have all of the vulnerabilities you want to know about. Well, first you got to know about all of the websites that you have which by the way is a lot. And then once you have those websites, you need to start determining, okay, do you have vulnerabilities on those websites? Part of my tactics here is actually to take a representative sample of each one of these different kind of categories as you see them, and then look at each one of those. So at that point for me, like one of the findings that I found was uh, a server-based uh, vulnerability where it was using uh, lithium query language that you can enumerate the entire database of users, their IDs, and their email addresses with one simple post request. But to do that, you've actually got to go ahead and enumerate using things like Burp Suite Pro 
each page accordingly. Because as Jason Haddix has taught me, there's nothing uh, quite as useful as walking through the website by hand, looking at all of the inputs, validating them, and of course, using tools like Hunt, uh, which uh, unfortunately I haven't actually browsed anything here, but Hunt, as, as Jason pointed out earlier, actually identifies those different kind of vulnerabilities based on things like if a column tag or an ID tag is in the request itself. So you can start to pretty quickly identify as browsing through all of these different pages, which ones have parameters that may be worth testing. And once you've identified those parameters and you start doing things like adding a single tick or uh, adding you know, single tick, semicolon, slash, uh, dash, dash, you can start to identify SQL injection. And by way of identifying that, you found a priority one, and then you start reporting those pretty quickly. Uh, I would recommend as well saving markdown files so that you can go ahead and uh, quickly report or copy paste report for different uh, common types of findings. One of my favorites is of course, uh, broken cryptography, which in, as Jeff pointed out, is not really cryptography. And the other of which happens to be that they're using HTTP instead of HTTPS by default. Uh, with that, I, I know that we're running out of time for this segment. As you can still see, this thing is still enumerating, uh, probably because it's been adding a bunch of, of different uh, subdomains. But any questions uh, from the panel? No, I think we're good. I think uh, we're going to wrap up this segment. Keith, thank you very much. That was awesome. Uh, and with that, we'll take a short break, come back, and talk about the security news for this week. <laughs> 